music assistant under Pastor Aaron Hufty. Currently, he is leading our First Youth Worship Choir and band over in Lagos Worship for their 11 o'clock service today. So he's given me this honor and this privilege to sing, to read scripture, and to lead worship with all of you. Before we sing, let us begin this service by thinking and pondering and reading the Word of God. Let's all read together Psalm 24, which says, The earth is the Lord's, and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let us continue that scripture as we put it into song, as we stand and sing hymn 247, Come Thou Almighty King. Amen, church. Let us continue our time of service as we turn and greet one of those another. And for those turning into our live stream and broadcast, welcome. As we greet all those around us in our church, we also greet you as well.
Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship. It's a joy to, to be able to worship together. So we're grateful for those of you in the room and thank you for everybody watching on television this morning. We're glad that we have this opportunity to worship in that way as well. Now, if you're new to First Baptist, we want to get to know you. And the way we do that are these cards that look like this. They should be in the pew back in front of you. If you would take one of those and fill it out and put it in the offering plate at the end of the service, that's how we get to know you. Similarly, for those watching on television, if you go to our website, fbcsa.org, and there's a connect button at the top there that has a similar online version of this card. Now, today, as we gather in for worship, we are celebrating that which Jesus Christ has done. When we look at our own effort, when we look at that which we do, it's nothing in comparison to the Christ. That is the work that matters. In fact, today we celebrate the work of Jesus in the supper. And so at the end of the sermon today, we're going to come to this time of supper. And I pray that now you'll begin to prepare your heart. You will thank the Lord for his work at the cross because that is the accomplishment that mattered for each and every one of us. And so prepare your heart now. And for those of you watching on television, we are going to take the supper together. So you want to prepare your own elements when we get to that time at the end of the service. So let's pray together and we'll continue in worship. Lord, we are grateful that we get to be together. We're grateful that we have a new opportunity for worship. Breath in our lungs to sing of your goodness. Lord, that we can sing and shout of the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. That at the cross we are healed. In the resurrection given new life. And Lord, we pray that today would be a day of thankfulness and relief. That we can be right with God because Jesus did everything that needed to be done. It's in His name, the name of the Christ, we pray. Amen. As we read this next scripture reading, we are reminded of Jesus, how he has given us promises that through that have given us hope, a hope that is everlasting, that will last through this life on something that Jesus had promised us that has given us. And it's on his word that we can rely on him. Let us reflect over that as we read through Romans 8. 18 through 25, which tells us, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also would be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Let's put those words into song as we stand and sing hymn 335, Standing on the Promises.
Yeah, children, come meet me down on the steps. I've got something to show you. Uh, something we made for you. I've got something homemade in here today. Come on down, everybody. Good morning. Got a couple more coming. You still got time. You're still good. Come on down. All right. Here we go. So I have something to show you that my daughters made yesterday. Now, they're not here. They're actually across the street with the youth choir today. But they made something for you in this service. So I'm going I'm to show you. Here's one of the things. What is this? Th that is a three. All right. What is, what is this? There's a zero. Okay, one more. Let me see here. All right, here is this, right here. All right, that what? So we've we've got three different numbers here. Oh yeah, it, I guess it matters how I hold them, right? What other number could it be, right? Is it forty-three? Yeah, oh, I got that backwards. All right, yeah, we got all these different numbers here. Let me ask you. I'm going to set this beside me. Let me ask you. What is your favorite number? Does anybody have a favorite number? Just say it out loud. What is it? Seven, eight, ten. ten. Go ahead. Seven. seven. Good. What's your favorite number? Four. Four. Good. What's your favorite? Seven. seven. Five. Five. Good. All of us have favorite numbers. So I'm going to point you to a favorite number in Scripture. All right. And it uses these numbers here. Does anybody have a guess of what, what the number is? We're going to talk about it in the sermon today. It's the first part of the sermon. I want you listening for this number. Does anybody have a guess what the number is that I'm going to talk about? No, it's not 340. 43. They're out of order right now. All right, wait, I got to I got to move it like 403. Not 403. 430. 430. Yeah, I put I put them in order. Is that the right is that 430 now? Yes. I'm looking at it backwards. It looks like 0 E H to me over here. No, is that 430? All right, we got 430. No, it's 430. I want you to listen to the sermon today. Okay? And I want you to listen for this number. And all the times I mention this number, okay, 430. And I want you to listen to why this number is so important. This number, 430, is one of the most important numbers in the Bible. Why? Well, I'm going to tell you in the sermon. But I'll, I'll, get, to, I'll get you a, a part of it now. Is what this represents is the work of Jesus Christ for us. That we can be saved because of what Jesus did at the cross. And it's connected with this number, 430. So I want you to listen in the sermon for how we connect 430 to the work of Jesus, okay? All right, let's pray together and we'll go. Lord, we thank you for this time together. And Lord, we pray that your word would shape our lives in a holy way. And I pray for each one of these students, Lord, that you'd be with them and near to them. And that this number, 430, would mean the world to them. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you all. Good job. Yeah. Why was six this next hymn is a great reminder that it's not just individually that we're worshiping God, but his presence is around us and we're worshiping together and not just here in this church, but all around the whole world. So remember what scripture says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. So let's stand and sing hymn 385, in Christ there is no east or west.
This morning we come to Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 18. If you'd find it on your listening sheet, we're going to read this aloud together. So find that and stand with me. This then is the text for today. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, was referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. What I'm saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. May God bless the reading of his word. You know, we love biblical numbers. Biblical numbers are are part of of much of the life of the church, and you see it in much of the literature of the church. Spotting and speculating on biblical numbers is one of our favorite pastimes. It's fun, though often futile. And most of these numbers, they, they intrigue us and they draw us in. But, but one of the things is, is the most intriguing numbers are intriguing because of their mysteriousness. Right? A number like 666. You know, people will often cringe when they see that number 666. How many of you, like I have done in the past, will, when you see 666 on the odometer, you speed up <laughs> to get past that number? As if evil will go away when the dial rolls over. Or, how many of you, when you have seen the number 666 in your bank account, you go buy something quickly so that that number goes away? We we hear that and and it gives us hesitation when, when we see that number. Because in the biblical text, the number 666 is associated with evil. When we come to Revelation thirteen eighteen, that's where that comes from, and and it's connected with the the beast. It's it's connected with with the evil and the incomplete nature of this world, and our minds love to fantasize about those things. We love to to hesitate when we come to those kinds of numbers, and in fact, fortunes have been made calculating and working on the number six six six. Now, seven, on the other hand, that's the biblical number of completion or perfection. Several of the kids said seven is their favorite number. That's a good biblical answer. It took seven days of creation. On the seventh day, God rested. It took Solomon seven years to build the temple. Seven is one of those numbers that, that we like. It's restful. Three is an important number of the Bible. We see three show up a number of times. We see Jesus is in the tomb for three days. Forty is another one of those biblical numbers that we love. Israel wanders in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days as he begins his ministry. And one of the things that we love to do, and this, this is perfectly holy, and it's a great thing to do as we're working through the text. When we see these biblical numbers show up, we, we try to find where the connection is. Where's the connection between the 40 years in the wilderness and the 40 days in the wilderness? When, when these numbers show up, it's one of those things that cause our mind to perk up and make connections across the pages of Scripture. That's a good thing. And these are all important numbers th- that I hope you recognize along the way. But today's number... It's just as important, if not more important, than those numbers that we've already mentioned. Yet we rarely, if ever, talk about the number 430. You think in the church, I know at least for myself, I've often heard of 7 or 40. 
or 666. But rarely have heard the number 430. As it comes, this number, 430, is the most important number for the Apostle Paul. 430, and, and as we come to in Galatians 3, this is the crux of his whole argument working through Galatians and Ephesians and Romans. 430 is where everything pivots in his argument to who we are in Jesus Christ. Salvation rests in this number of 430 and what 430 points to. Most Christians have no idea. And we rarely talk about 430. When Paul would make the case, 430 is the number we need to be talking about the most. You know, I, I think that we like to talk about 666 more. Because that's seen as a future number. It's part of the mystery, right? There's still some unknown in that number. There's a hint of evil sprinkled in. We always love to hear those things. That number, 666, it's, it's tasty to people who love hot takes. But 430 is far more important to the shape of our lives than 666. 430 is the number of our salvation. Look with me at Galatians 3.17. So what I'm saying to you is this. And I just notice how he starts verse 17. He's saying, he's coming back. This is my thesis. Right? This, this is what this rests on. My legal argument against legalism is this. What I'm saying. The law which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify His promise. The promise of faith bringing righteousness came long before the law even existed. 430 years before the law came down from heaven onto Mount Sinai. But before Moses, and long before Moses, centuries, 430 years before Moses, this life and the shape of your life towards righteousness was of faith, not works. Of grace, not law. Right? And this is a matter of, of primacy. It, it's a matter of what came first. And so when, when we think about grace and, and salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, this is not a matter of the New Testament. This is a matter of the Old Testament. Scripture as a whole, long before the law, was faith in the work of our God. You know, sometimes when we talk about salvation by grace or when we talk about faith alone or when we talk about faith versus works, we think of it as something new instituted in the incarnational ministry of Jesus Christ, right? What we read in the Gospels. However, the, the argument that Paul is making here is that is not new. This is the way of God since the beginning. Since Genesis 1-1, the foundation of things was wrapped up in the faith of God's people, never has it been in their works or their effort. See, the grace of God was available to God's people from the beginning. Now, the law is good, and this is, as the Apostle Paul works through in Galatians, that, so why then the law? The law is good. Following the law is good, but keeping a stringent adherence to the law was never going to bring anyone salvation. Salvation came by faith first, 430 years prior to the law even being instituted. So the law isn't a contradiction. The law isn't something to be eradicated. The law has its place, but it's secondary. It's temporary, and it's always been that way. The law has always been secondary. The law has always been temporary. So then what 430 means is that you don't have to work your way to heaven. 
when you hear the number 430, that should be relief. 430 represents the burdens of this life being lifted off your shoulders and placed under the cross of Jesus Christ. 430, what it points us to is that when you have done something wrong, you don't have to slave away in contrition to try to make things right again. When you recognize your own failure in this life, there aren't a series of tasks that you have to complete and overcome to make sure you're okay with God again. See, our natural tendency is for us to think that for me to be near to God or, or for me to know the Spirit of God coming down upon my life is, is we think in our flesh, well, then I have to be really good. And, and if I can be really good, and if I do enough good things, then I can see God and know God. That if I will work really hard at being a good person, and when I finally get everything right, then I will seek God. But it's nonsense. It's never what the Scripture has taught. Scripture says... 430. 430 means you don't have to work really hard at being good. 430 means you don't, you don't have to do lots of good things to try to get a shot at righteousness with God. 430 means your righteousness has never depended on your effort or how many good deeds you have done. Because 430 years before the law, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. That it is belief in who God is and it's belief in the work God does. That is where righteousness is found. So 430 is this relief. It, it's not about my effort. It's not about my goodness. It's not about my work. It's not about me making up for anything. Jesus Christ did all of that. And, and this, this was proven and worked out in God long before the law was ever given. Salvation is in faith. Like Abraham believed and was righteous. And so we can see and begin to see how our lives are dramatically shaped by this number, 430. And, and I want you to see, though, that's, that's kind of the surface. If, if, we'll, if we will get in a little bit deeper, we see that that 430 represents something else. It, it represents that ultimately our lives are being shaped by a person. Now, 430 represents that initial promise to Abraham. But the promise to Abraham would not be fulfilled for thousands of years. And, and so that when Abraham, or when the Old Testament talks about Abraham's descendants, there's only one. And th this is the, the other part of Paul's argument in this text, is we often talk about Abraham's descendants as plural, descendants with an S. But this whole thing and the whole story of Scripture, the story of Abraham and the promise to Abraham, the story of the people of Israel through the working out of the Old Testament, is only about one descendant singular. It's not about descendants plural. It's about one descendant singular, the descendant Jesus Christ. See, the first two-thirds of Scripture that we call the Old Testament, they're the history of this setting of the stage for the single heir of Abraham. Every page of the Old Testament pointing forward to Jesus Christ himself. So I want you to, to notice with me, there's a couple of verses as we work down through here that help mold you into the person that you are intended to be. First look with me at, at Galatians 3.22. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise, and note this, by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And so it, this is about those who believe in Jesus. So our side of things is about believing in the work of Jesus Christ. So, so note the difference here. It's not about your work. It's not about your effort. It's not about your accomplishments. It's that you believe in the work of Jesus' accomplishments. So keep moving down. Let's look at 26. Similarly, but now that faith has come, 
We're no longer under a tutor. Faith in Christ Jesus. 27. For you're all baptized into Christ. You've clothed yourself now with Jesus Christ. You know, every day of this life, we expend a, a great amount of energy. And so, so much of life seems to be about this and, and how we expend the energy that we're given. We even notice if you consider the, the way your body works, even as you sleep, you, you burn about 500 calories. Then, then you get up. And, and you start to do all the things that need to be done in the day. And you spend another couple thousand calories in the day. Right? And we, we spend way too much effort thinking through these kinds of things. All, all of our life, we're working through what we're to do. We've got to pick up around the house today. I've got to walk the dog. I have to get gas. I've got to go to the grocery store. And there are things that need to be taken care of at work. And, and the day just fills up with all these things that you have to do that you don't have time to do. And, and this is what we default to in life. Or the, all of these to-do lists that we have to do so that we can get right and, and have some sense of peace in our heart. And this is what we default to in, in religion. This is what we default to spiritually. But when we meet Jesus... It's something different. But so where our heart goes is, is we get restless when we don't have a list of things that we're supposed to accomplish today for Jesus. But, but our lives aren't shaped by what we do for Jesus. Our, our lives are shaped by what Jesus has done for us. I mean, we act like it's the, the opposite way around, that it's about our effort for Jesus when everything in Scripture says Jesus has accomplished it all and everything that needs to be accomplished was accomplished at the cross. And so celebrate the work of Jesus Christ our Lord. See, everything in this life goes one way or the other. Everything in this life is, is either about your belief in your effort or your belief in Jesus' effort. Everything in life is about either what you accomplish or what Jesus has accomplished. And, and where are we going to stand? Are you going to stand on the work of your hands or are you going to stand on the work of the nail-scarred hands of Christ? Because that's your choice. And too many, even in the church, rely on their own effort and the work of their own hands and the work of their own feet when Jesus Christ has accomplished that which needs to be done. You see, when the text points to faith in Jesus, it's just saying, do you believe in His work instead of your own? To trust in His expended effort rather than what you've accomplished. So this life, it, it looks like what Jesus has already done. You're clothed with Jesus. You know, even with this line that we see that, that Paul uses here, uh, often we, we go to the work side of things rather than the faith side. And we, when we hear clothe yourself with Christ, we start to imagine where are his burial clothes? What would it look like for me to go find that which he was wearing and put it on so I can wear the same garment that Jesus wore? But, but he's not, he's just clothe yourself with Christ. It's, it's not about wearing what Jesus wore. But to be clothed with Jesus Christ himself, that you, you can know him and that he lives in you. And so I, I think it may be better for us to think of it in this way, rather than being clothed with Christ, to picture the, this Old Testament image of, of the potter and the clay. And being clothed with Christ is, is something akin to your life being reshaped and, and reformed into the work and by the work of Jesus. And, and so that, that you believe that Jesus is reshaping your lives so that you begin to see far more fruit of the Spirit than you've ever seen in your life. So that you no longer look like the historical you, but now there's more love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. That, that these things start to show up in ways that they've never shown up before. 
This is evidence of the Spirit of God working in you. This is, this is clothed with Christ and walking in His ways instead of your own. That more and more your life looks like Jesus, the person. You begin to resemble Him like you might resemble a parent. You know, it's hard because most people still live their lives like they're, they're shaped instead by the law. Most people live their lives like, like, like it's shaped by effort that they can come up with in their selves. And when Scripture talks about this law, you can hear a few different things. We, we know as, as Paul's working through Galatians, we are talking specifically about the Ten Commandments. The, the laws that we find in the Old Testament and then, then how those were expressed. We get to the, the Pharisees' fence laws that Jesus was always uh, butting up against. And so, so it, it is all of those things that we, get to, we begin to sense, but, but it's also those things represent human effort and, and our ability to work towards saving ourselves. And too often, hum humans believe that if we work hard enough, we'll be able to save ourselves. You know, so that if we want to be right with God, or if we're feeling a sense of guilt, we naturally try to find a way to work through it. We, we try to find ourselves something good to do to make up for our sense of guilt, when in reality, there's nothing you can do to make up for it. There's nothing that you can do that will ever impress God. We think if we do enough ministry, if we do enough things, that we'll be able to impress God by our actions and by our work and by our effort, then that God will look down and be so impressed with us that He will call us righteous. Now, I've got a little two-year-old at home. And, and almost do, and she loves to show off. And her most recent trick is my other daughters have this gymnastics bar in the house. And the little two-year-old goes up and grabs the bar and does this. And just looks up. And she comes down and she has a huge smile on her face. And she wants the whole house to applaud. And she wants all of us to say, yay, Juliet, you did it. And she just, and goes straight back. <laughs> And look it up. And, and I go and I, I pat her on the back and I said, baby, you did so good. Now, let me say this. This morning, she's over in the nursery, so she's not in the room. So between us, and we'll keep this just between us, when she does this, it's not that impressive. <laughs> I, I, t I tell her it is. But I gotta, I gotta say, it's... It's pretty minor in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> and I hope you hear me in a similar way. God is not impressed. He's not impressed with the stuff you have done. He, he's not impressed with the ministry that you've done this week. God's not going to give you something extra because of something you did. God's not going to finally forgive you for an indiscretion because you impressed him with a new trick. Working really hard at ministry or praying more this week than you did last week. Your effort is never going to fix what needs to be fixed in your life. Your, your efforts are, are never going to impress God and make him look and say, Oh, he's righteous. She's righteous. And when we see the law here in this text, there, there's something specific he talks about in verses 24 and 25. He says the, the law is good. And, and there was a place for the law. He, he, he writes about a tutor for little ones. And I think it's probably more... Um, easily heard, if, if we think it in this way, it, it's more similar to a nanny. The, the law functions like an ancient Roman nanny. So in that world, the parents would have a, a, a nanny that would come and take care of their child. 
to protect them from something like, you know, two to 12, something like that. The nanny was always there, always present to, to slap them on the wrist when they reached up towards the stove. The nanny was always there to pull them away when, when they reached towards the socket with a set of keys to pull them away and say, don't do that. The nanny was there to walk them to school, to bring them home from school. The nanny was there to give instruction and say, this is what you need to do and this is what you don't need to do. There to protect them, to teach them, to keep the little ones in line. And Paul says, this is, this is how the law functions for us. The, the law is, is not the list of things to do so that you might be saved. In fact, it's just the opposite. The, the law is, is like the nanny slapping you on the wrist. The, the law, what the law reveals is all the places that you need to grow. What the law reveals is that you are imperfect. What the law reveals is not one of us is good, only God alone. The law reveals then our sinfulness and our inability to be that which we are supposed to be. That we are failed and we are broken. And the law shines a light on that brokenness of our lives so that we might be healed by the body and blood of Jesus Christ. See, the law is in our lives not to save us, but just the opposite. The law reveals our weaknesses and the need of salvation. The law reveals how often we go astray, a sort of nanny over us that reveals how much we truly need Jesus in our lives. You see, the point and the hope is that neither the law nor any effort of our own would ever bring righteousness or salvation into our lives. If it was the law that saved us or if it was any human effort that shaped our lives, it would be broken incomplete, ineffectual. Because all the law does is, is reveal the cracks of our being, the brokenness in our hearts, the shadows of our minds. The law is revelatory in that way. And it points us to the wonderful and matchless grace of our God in the person of Jesus Christ. So then we come to the supper. So deacons, if you would, help prepare the table. So what the supper means as we come to take of the bread and the cup together is this is the work of Jesus Christ that was necessary. So Jesus, as he was gathering his, his apostles in together, he was saying, I'm about to walk to the cross and accomplish that which needs to be accomplished for your salvation. And when that happens, you are never to forget that good work. And so Jesus charged the church in this way to say, it is your job in the church to remember. And we're blessed because one of the great works of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is one who reminds us. When, when we remember God's good work, or when we remember Scripture, when we remember a hymn, that, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so, Jesus said, as the Spirit comes on the church, they will constantly remember my work at the cross and know that it is complete. And so every time we, we drink the cup, every time we eat the bread, we are thanking the Lord for that work and for that relief. And it's not on us. It's on the Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray knowing our own brokenness. Things hidden in our hearts. And Lord, we pray that you would forgive us for our evil intentions, for our wayward imaginations, for all of the ways that we have taken life on 
forgive us. Lord, we pray this morning as we take the supper that you would let us fall into the arms of Jesus Christ and be relieved. Lord, free us from the burden of guilt. Lord, free us from the burden of accomplishment. And let us rejoice in the goodness of Jesus Christ. It's in His name, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Deacons, come and serve.
Take now the bread. So we do as our Lord Jesus asked. Remember my work. You pass it down to the church. And this is, this is the way it's told in 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, he took some bread and he gave thanks. He says, this is my body which is for you. Do this 